there's a very special bond between mothers and their offspring, and, and that needs to be. Those offspring need the protection of the mother, whatever species she may be. Hello and welcome to Notes from the Bee Yard. You're listening to Episode 23, Motherhood. Like parenthood, childhood, brotherhood, widowhood, motherhood describes a special state of being. It's something separate and held apart from the whole. In this episode, we get to hear about motherhood from the outside, described by a close and interested observer. My name is Laura Tyler. I'm your producer and host. This is episode 23, written by Tom Theobald in 1991, and read by Tom in 2021. The bond between mother and child is sometimes a mystery to men, myself included. It isn't so much the bond itself, actually. Any of us who are fathers can appreciate the ties between parent and offspring. But there's something very special about the chemistry of motherhood. At times it can be almost frightening in intensity. I recall an episode with our own daughter, Tracy, on her first day of school. Barbara waited at the bus stop with her squeaky clean little darling in that autumnal rite of passage which I can still see taking place up and down the street each September. Finally, the bus arrived. Tracy started off on her first great adventure, full of confidence, and Barbara shed a few tears on the short walk back to an empty house. I returned from work that afternoon to find my normally mellow wife distraught. She alternately paced and fumed, wept and ranted. I've had her for five years without a problem, she sputtered. They've had her for five hours and they've lost her. When the school bus had disgorged the precious cargo at the corner, Tracy had not been among the munchkins. Instantly, Barbara had gone into overdrive, first questioning the kids, Then on the phone, irate, distressed. Certainly they haven't lost a child, I thought, outwardly at least, much calmer than my wife. They handle hundreds of children every day, Barbara. They haven't lost your daughter. I comforted, vowing quietly to myself to dismember someone if my confidence were misplaced. The explanation proved to be a simple one, and the mystery was solved within the hour. Tracy had gotten on the bus, we found, after grilling some of her playmates. She had started school a day or two late because of some life-threatening childhood illness, the sniffles, perhaps. Her little friends were to help her get on the right bus, but in the rush to leave school, All of those instructions were forgotten. With the uncomplicated trust of a five-year-old, Tracy thought she could simply get on any bus and it would take her home. Simple enough. She boarded the first school bus she came to. We live on a short, discontinuous stretch of Neva Road. Neva Road doesn't exist to the east of us, but starts up again about four miles west and continues to the foothills. Tracy might have said something like, I live on a farm on Nebo Road, by the mountains. There's also a Nebo Road out west to add to the confusion. In any event, she soon showed up in a car driven by the school bus supervisor. She had ridden the full route out to the mountains, then returned to Longmont with the driver in an empty bus. 
She was full of stories of her long ride, but to this day the thing she remembers most was that the man had a telephone in his car, Dad. The impression this little incident left with me was the ferocity of Barbara's motherhood, and I silently reminded myself to never come between a mother and a child. The intensity of this bond is certainly not the sole province of our species, as anyone who has spent time around animals can attest. While a bull may show little interest in his calves, a mother cow can be a formidable protector. Heaven help the farmer who makes a misstep between a litter of pigs and a particularly sensitive sow. As a child, I even remember a normally gentle garter snake which coiled up and struck at me when I turned over a board and found her with her newly hatched young. Mother hens display their own special brand of motherhood. Like a mother hen has long been a part of the language. It's always a delight to watch one of our hens hovering over her fluffy little charges, clucking softly as she teaches them to peck at tender morsels, or insistently as she calls them to her safety, charging any other chicken which dares to stray too close. We don't let hens set every year, as much as we might like to. If we did, we would soon be overrun with chickens, especially roosters. It wouldn't be much of a problem if we were prepared to lop a few heads each year, but since we aren't, we have to keep the population in control. Yet, occasionally, one of the hens will quietly accumulate a clutch of eggs in some out-of-the-way place, then disappear. We are always on the lookout for these surreptitious nests as we make our rounds each day. But every now and then, one of the hens is so good at her hiding that, search as we may, we cannot find her. So, as I went outside one summer morning, I wasn't surprised to hear the conversation of hen and chicks. The wild one had been missing for a month, and as I threw out the scratch, she proudly strutted into the chicken yard with her brood. Dennis Bora had called two weeks after he cleared off the farm. Tom, there are some chickens left in the barn. Could you take them? I agreed, but realized when I got over to the silent, empty farm that these were some of Dennis's wild chickens, which had been living an independent life of their own. Their roost was in the rafters of the hayloft, and it took three of us several nights to collect them all. As we each snatched a chicken, the balance would take off in the dark, out the open loft door. They hit the ground running, and that was the last we would see of them until the next night. The wild one was one which I kept for myself. As soon as daylight came on her first morning in her new home, she split. I didn't see her for two days and then finally spotted her when I came out to feed one evening. I began feeding her at the woodpile. Over a period of three weeks, in twenty below weather, I slowly moved the feed spot toward home until she grudgingly consented to take up residence in the coop. Her ties to home were always conditional, however, and I admired how she had maintained her independence. As the wild one entered the chicken yard, the other hens approached to inspect her brood. But she would brook no interference, and one by one she drove them off. That is, with the exception of one unnamed hen, who seemed to find these chicks particularly intriguing. I thought of Gloria, a hen apparently miswired somewhere along the line, 
who had attacked and killed several newly hatched chicks the year before. The feathers flew with regularity over the next few days, but the intruder would not relent. Her interests were benign, and little by little the wild one began to resign herself to joint custody with this hen. We were now calling Aunt M. The chicks had little problem adjusting to their surrogate mother, and at the first sign of danger would distribute themselves randomly between two parents. Between them, Aunt Em and the Wild One raised this large batch of chicks to adulthood without losing a single one. They became fast friends and continued their companionship even after the chicks were off on their own. I was always puzzled by what had driven Aunt Em. At the age of four, having never had chicks of her own, the urge to mother was still strong enough that she endured three days of beatings in order to become a step-parent. Ah, motherhood. So your column is called Notes from the Bee Yard. The podcast is Notes from the Bee Yard. Do you want to tell me a little bit about how these stories about family life, how are they all woven into that theme? Well, the excuse at first was notes from the bee yard. That's how I sold this to the fence post, the publication in which they appeared. And as I've said earlier, the intention was to take people through a year of beekeeping. But that soon disintegrated into stories of all kinds, whatever was occurring in my life, I shared with the readers. Back to this theme of motherhood, something that makes me smile in your writing is there's a slight self-deprecating tone. I can see this lighthearted tone, you know, acknowledging that, yeah, it's scary when your kid misses the bus on their first day of school, but also poking a little bit of fun at yourself as well. Mm. I think in terms of motherhood, my behavior as a parent is not nearly as ferocious as what I saw in Barbara. I mean, ultimately, I might have been just as ferocious. But there's a special bond between mothers and their offspring. And it doesn't matter if you're a human a pig, a mother cow, there's a very special bond between mothers and their offspring, and that needs to be. Those offspring need the protection of the mother, whatever species she may be, for those first weeks, months, years, depends on the species. Again, you're talking about the chickens here. Tell me what you've learned about motherhood by watching the chickens. Chickens are great mothers. Chickens are very attentive mothers, just as humans are, most of them. But chickens demonstrate those qualities very clearly to anybody who is willing to watch. So can you describe to me what some of those behaviors are that the chickens do? Well, they're very protective of their chicks, and they're very reluctant in the beginning to share those chicks with anyone, any other hens. It takes a little time for them to relax and share the mothering with the other hens in the flock. And the wild one was particularly that way. And poor old Aunt Am just got the feathers beaten out of her. She was so determined to be a surrogate mother. And given enough time, she finally wormed her way in and she became the second mother. You know, these are folksy stories in some ways. They're familiar. They're almost like childhood, you know, barnyard stories. But then there's often a, an interesting twist and it ends up going somewhere that I wasn't anticipating. Dennis had small bandy chickens of which I had 
take possession of, and they roosted in his big old cottonwood tree out behind the house. And this was before I had started writing, and I imagined a news story with the headline, Local Farmer Killed by Falling Chicken, because <laughs> I thought when the cold weather came, these bandies were going to start falling out of the trees like blocks of ice. <laughs> it never did happen, but... Yeah. How do they take care of themselves in the wintertime? I don't recall. I don't know if they moved into the barn or what they did. I may have wound up with them. Yeah. They might That, that might have been the chickens that I snatched out of the barn loft. <laughs> So what's it like reading this story now, after all these years? What do you think? What do you feel? It's very enjoyable. It brings back memory of people who are now gone, who were good friends at the time, and going down and catching those last chickens in the barn every night with good friends. That brings back some good memories. Thank you for listening to Notes from the Bee Yard. We publish new episodes on Fridays at noon. Join us next week for episode 24. In the meantime, hop on over to notesfromthebeeyard.buzz to subscribe. <laughs>